Hi, in this video I thought we'd have another look at the lighting project and where we left off last time is when I connected this board up to all of my lab lights which is about 140 watts of LED lighting, so uh, 14 individual LED drivers, uh, what happened is the small MOSFETs that were fitted to this board uh, just blew up basically and it behaved much better with the slightly bigger MOSFETs um, and what I wanted to do really is work out what the problem was. So each LED lamp has an LED driver and it does have some amount of capacitance on the input circuitry to that driver and what happens is if the uh, lights happen to switch on mid, mid AC waveform um, you'll get a big inrush current because there's no way of limiting that current trying to charge that capacitor and if you accumulate that over 14 uh, LED drivers then that's actually quite a high peak current. So just back to what we're trying to achieve um, so what we're trying to do is trigger the gate right on the zero crossing point and then turn it off at some point through the waveform so that you achieve the desired brightness. And actually with a bit of analysis what was actually happening was the gate wasn't actually firing until quite a long way down the waveform, so about this point here which is about 40 volts, which means that um, it was trying to charge that capacitor immediately with 40 volts and you know 14 of those quite a high amount of current. Um, and I wanted to really to have another look at the zero crossing detector. So I've been having a look down this rabbit hole of how to trigger it bang on the zero crossing point. And the whole reason that we're using this particular topology is uh, mainly because of how I want to set up the design. So if you remember from my original uh, video introducing this idea, I was going to have a bunch of different lights connected to this unit onto this sort of baseboard PCB, so where we could plug in different drivers uh, onto a main board and individually control these and mix and match these plug-in PCBs however we want depending on uh, what we want to connect to the board. There's a potential that we don't want anything to do with the mains AC on the rest of this board because we might be driving LEDs with a simple PWM driver uh, or with a constant current driver or it might just be driving a relay but also there is going to be uh, some interfacing with this board potentially so there might be an RS485 interface or something and basically I just don't want to have mains where we don't need it or mains referenced potentials anywhere that we don't need it. If we're going to have an AC dimmer, we want to contain the AC onto this board and not have it on the rest of the board. So what that means is uh, we need to use some kind of zero crossing detector that has an opto isolator. So the overall schematic um, for the board that uh, had the MOSFETs on is here and we've got this um, isolation point all the way through here uh, and in order to drive the MOSFETs we're driving it through an opto coupled interface. To dr power the electronics on this side we've got an isolated DC to DC converter and to detect when the zero crossing point occurs we've got this opto isolator again which is providing our isolation. So this is the bit that's going to be sort of on the, the main part that's on that uh, little plug-in board and then these are going to be the interfaces to the microcontroller that's on the main board and we really want to keep all of this side uh, AC potential and nothing AC related on this side. So I did a little bit of analysis at the time on the zero crossing detector that I designed and basically what I'd worked out is that the, the time where it's actually turning on the LED fully is only going to be around 46 microseconds but it actually turned out that that isn't the case and that's partially because this optocoupler, um, first of all the LED will turn on at much lower voltages than that so you get a small amount of current but also there's what's known as the current transfer ratio and effectively what you're doing is the LED is replacing the base connection on your transistor. So if the LED is not at full brightness you're basically biasing this transistor on at some point. It's not fully turned on um, so you'll sort of um, in this configuration where we've got this open collector with the pull-up what you'll actually see is as the current through the LED increases the current being drawn uh, being pulled through the transistor increases but there will be a point where there's a slope on this uh, pulse here so it's never going to be a nice digital pulse without some additional electronics here. So what we're actually doing is turning on the gate when the AC waveform was at about 40 volts so um, it was staying off until 40 volts the gate would then fire and it would immediately try and charge that uh, capacitor on the input circuitry to the drivers and I think we we're drawing a high current enough there to uh, cause those uh, MOSFETs to eventually break down. So I actually fired up LT Spice and started simulating a whole load of circuits. So what we've got here is our original implementation here. 
Uh, we've got one here that uses a bipolar transistor to fully turn on the LED sort of at the part way through the AC waveform. So that switches it on quite hard and you don't see that slope. Uh, and then we've got a couple of um, schematics here that use a comparator to measure the voltage in comparison to um, the ground reference and then it fully just, it's got a digital output effectively so it just switches on the LED and we get a nice square pulse. So the output for the schematic with the comparator is actually um, a nice square wave. You can see we've got our AC waveform here and then you can just about see the scale is quite small in comparison. There's a little square wave that comes out. Um, this is what it looks like close up, so the AC waveform goes way off screen, uh, but you get this square wave for every zero crossing point that it goes through because uh, it goes through the zero point and then negative and then back up again. So we get a nice square wave and that had a really good response. So I actually uh, built up this circuit here on a bit of breadboard. It's a bit sketchy because it's powered by mains. Uh, you wouldn't really use one of these um, if you were trying to do anything serious because it's, it's quite easy to get a fault to occur. Uh, that would mean that you get AC tracking all over the board. Um, but I tested this and it worked really well um, in terms of a zero crossing detector. But I was starting to think this is getting really complicated. Look at all these components that I've got on the board just to do this very simple feature. Um, so I thought what can we do to get back to basics and I revisited the um, schematic that represents this very simple circuit here and I simulated it on top of the, um, the one using the comparator and you can see this is our pulse from the optocoupler and you can see you've got this slope and the problem is that this is not really well defined because we feed this into our um, digital input on the microcontroller and it could sort of trigger at any point along this waveform depending on the uh, particulars of the input so it could be as wide as down here or it could be as narrow as up here, which would be the ideal, because this is uh, basically right on the zero crossing point. So what I've actually done is I've written a bit of software uh, for the microcontroller, and what it's doing is it's looking at where the pulse starts and where the pulse ends, and it doesn't really matter where on the waveform it does this, and then basically it just halves that time and uses that as the zero crossing point for the next um, AC cycle. So it's sort of using the, the history of the previous one to do that. And it means that I can hit the uh, zero crossing point, bang on the zero point. And hopefully what that will mean is that we don't blow up these MOSFETs when we try it again. So I'll just show you the waveforms on the oscilloscope. Uh, and then what we'll do actually is take off these transistors and put the little ones back in and see what happens if we connect up the lab lights. And if it blows up again, then basically uh, it's clearly down to the, the dissipation of those MOSFETs. Uh, otherwise, it was because we had such a high inrush current. And just as an aside, um, this is a very light V-Pro dimmer and we'll do a little bit of analysis in the next video I think. Um, if you watch John Ward's channel, he's been doing a few videos about these dimmers um, and um, I thought we'd do a few measurements with this and then it does actually come apart quite easily and I thought what I'd do is probably reverse engineer this and just see what they're doing because uh, in something like this, this level of complication really isn't needed because um, this whole thing is self-contained. The microcontroller is going to be running from the mains as well. So you don't need any of this isolation business. All you do is um, you can feed the AC input directly into one of the pins on the microcontroller uh, just through some series resistance and either use the uh, ESD protection diodes on the pin or just add a few diodes externally. But it means you can just trigger um, you know, directly without any of this other business involved. So you have to forgive me for filming the oscilloscope directly, but the Ultra Sigma software was a little bit laggy last time. I thought you'd want to be able to see exactly what's on the oscilloscope screen. So what we've got in yellow is our AC waveform measured by the differential probe directly on the output of the isolation transformer. And then if we zoom in quite a bit, uh, what we've got in turquoise is the output from the optocoupler straight into the microcontroller. So you can see it's that sort of slope as the LED turns on and then as it turns off again. And this point here on the channel 4, the dark blue, is where the actual GPIO triggered on the microcontroller. So it's 200 microseconds before the center of the zero crossing point and we were triggering on the falling edge so it's somewhere around here so another 200 microseconds after that. Uh, and including all of the sort of delays in the software um, we were triggering at about 35 to 40 volts uh, on the AC waveform at that point. 
So what we've got here is um, a square wave which shows uh, where the timer has been triggered and then this point here is where the calculated zero crossing point is um, from the software. So it's just as it's crossing the zero crossing point here. It's only at about one or two volts at this point here on the AC waveform. And I've got uh, just a standard incandescent lamp connected, but it drives that um, lamp absolutely fine. I can increase the brightness and decrease it. And, um, you know, it triggers from that point on. And this is the, uh, the output here, but it works absolutely fine. And just a quick reminder of the scale. So our AC is on channel one, so 100 volts per division, and it's not very clear, uh, but one division is at this point here. And so you can see at the point where we were probably triggering the gate last time around here, we're already at 50 volts. So um, yeah, th that would have resulted in a relatively high inrush current through those MOSFETs. Okay, so now I've replaced these uh, transistors. This is all turned on now. Uh, we've got the incandescent lamp, so just to check that that's working properly, just dim it up. And we seem to have uh, light there, no problem. On and off, no problems. And if we swap this out for the LED lamp, let's see what happens now. So there we go, we're able to control that, no problems as well. And what I noticed in editing last time actually is when the MOSFET started to go bad, there was actually an audible click on the microphone. Uh, I couldn't hear it, but it obviously came, uh, it got picked up electrically through uh, the audio system. Um, so certainly there was uh, some transient or something that caused those MOSFETs to blow up. Uh, but that LED lamp seems to work okay. So the final test is to connect up the lab lights with all 14 lamps connected to it and see what happens. Right, so I've put the little MOSFETs back in again, and in the firmware, I've also added a little feature. So I think probably one of the main failures last time was that we saw some noise on the zero crossing uh, waveform, and that was probably causing the gate to trigger multiple times in a very short period of time, which led to the uh, much quicker death of the MOSFETs than potentially would have happened before. So after the first uh, rising edge of the zero crossing uh, detection circuit, we actually inhibit the possibility of another trigger for five milliseconds, so halfway through one cycle, to try and eliminate any false triggering. So I'll turn on the mains at the plug now, and we can see we've got the trigger here, and all of the lab lights are connected, so let's see what happens if we turn it on. So there we go, they came in at full power, Let's try dimming it down. And that looks significantly better. We're not even seeing the glitch on the zero. Cro oh, it's flickering a little bit there. So we're getting a little bit of glitching actually with the dimming. It's not actually um, causing any flickering once it's in steady state. Right, so I've changed the firmware to about a quarter of the speed now. So if we ramp up the brightness, you can see there's a little bit of a flicker as it's ramping up. Just on that little bit of a slope there, and you see a little bit of noise occurring. Now, the noise probably isn't on the bits that we're probing. It's probably being picked up by uh, the long ground leads. So I wouldn't read too much into that being physically on the gate trigger and the uh, zero crossing waveform but there's definitely something weird that happens just at that point. And we are running from the isolation transformer, and even with the uh, just the single lamp, you see this weird glitch in the AC waveform. And I'm wondering if actually it's just the isolation transformer causing a bit of grief. So uh, I will just uh, try plugging this directly into the mains and see if that still occurs. Okay, so we're now plugged in directly to the mains. The sinusoidal waveform still plugged into the isolation transformer because it happens to have a uh, couple of nice points to plug in the differential probe. Let's see if we get the same effect. Oh, nothing. So that was the uh, isolation transformer. I think we were seeing some inductive effect of the transformer in there along with all this capacitive load. So there's probably a little bit of resonance there. And yeah, that's behaving perfectly now. That's really nice. 
So I think that's a fairly reasonable solution now. Um, I know I said last time that this zero crossing detector probably wasn't the best design and that's mainly because these resistors are dropping all of the power for the infrared LED in the optocoupler. So we're running the LED at around 5 milliamps RMS. Uh, what we could do is increase the value of these resistors to reduce the overall dissipation. The side effect will be that the zero crossing pulse will be a bit wider um, so it will slope up like this but the new firmware will detect that and work out the zero crossing point from each side. So we could certainly drop down the current. The other thing that we could do is um, we're going to have this solution here and it's going to have its own power supply. I was thinking of using a little switch mode power supply but we could use a toroidal transformer. Uh, it's going to be a similar cost uh, whether we use a switch mode or a toroidal transformer because this board's going to use sod all really in terms of power. So we're looking at somewhere between five and ten pounds uh, budget for whatever uh, power supply we use. If we use a little transformer we can actually uh, just implement a circuit like this straight off the AC supply into the board, the low voltage, so it could be 6, 9 or 12 volts and that will be much easier to interface with the microcontroller because we only need one zero crossing trigger even if we've got four AC dimmers plugged in uh, because it only needs one reference. So we could take the reference from here and eliminate all of the high power uh, dissipation. We could still place these parts on the PCB, on this little PCB here, so that if we need to use it we can. Uh, so if uh, toroidal transformers for whatever reason don't become available in the future or something we can um, use that method. Uh, but we could certainly fit something much lower power on the main board running at uh, extra low voltage uh, to do the zero crossing. So uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put all of this onto one board and just check it all behaves absolutely fine. Uh, and then after that we'll go on to designing the rest of the system. So in the next video we'll have a look at this dimmer switch, we'll take it apart properly. Uh, I'll try and reverse engineer the uh, PCB and it has got a PIC 12F on here so I'm sure they will have co-protected it but what we'll do is we'll take off the chip and stick it in the uh, EEPROM reader and see if we can read back the code and maybe I'll see if I can reverse engineer it but I'm, I'm sure they will have co-protected that chip. But it'll be interesting to see what they've got on here. First glance suggests there's just one MOSFET and they're using the bridge rectifier. Um, so one of the schematics that I drew in the first video in this series was using this similar arrangement. But um, we'll save looking at uh, the details until the next video. Um, so I hope you found that video useful. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already, give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And until next time, thanks for watching.